Welcome to the Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners podcast. You will hear about industry insights with award-winning financial planner and entrepreneur, Jason Pereira. Through the interviews with different experts with their stories and advice, you will learn how you can navigate the challenges of being an entrepreneur, plan for success, and make the most of your business and life. And now, your host, Jason Pereira. Hello and welcome. Today on the show, I have a friend and colleague, Aaron Hector, who is a private wealth advisor for CWB Wealth. Brought on the show to talk about old age security. Basically, what is it, how it works, how you can plan around it, and what are some of the unique planning opportunities that exist? And this is kind of the, let's call it, less paid attention to benefit compared to Canada Pension Plan, because there's a lot more optionality there, but it's still one that is a cornerstone to Canadian retirement. And with that, here's my interview with Aaron. Aaron, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me on, Jason. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It's good to chat. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm a financial planner. I work with CWB Wealth and um, the majority of my time is spent uh, serving private clients who I've worked with for, in most cases, many, many years, helping them out with their retirement planning, with their taxes. Our our firm does tax preparation, personal tax preparation in-house. We have investment professionals as well. Uh, I'm not one of the investment guys, but uh, we work as a team to help serve our clients. So my hat is really just around the the financial planning and tax and estate planning and, and all of those different things. Excellent. And you've done a bunch of writing for various periodicals, which has always been stellar. So anyone looking up uh, Aaron should look up some of the things he's published in the past. So I brought you on the show today to talk about old age security, and you've been one of the few who's actually spent time writing about this topic. Like I said, it's, it's an overlooked benefit compared to Canada Pension Plan, and, and too often it's just a one commentary about clawback, which we'll get to. Uh, but let's talk about old age security. Tell us about what it is, who qualifies for it, how it works, and uh, what you can get. Yeah, first of all, it's a government pension. You need to be at least 65 years old to begin to receive it. It's for those who have residency within Canada, either current residency or former residency. You need to have lived in Canada for at least 10 years after you're 18 years old. So the the time really starts when you're 18 as far as tracking your years of residency. For those who live in Canada their entire life, you you pretty much are guaranteed to max out your entitlements. So to to get the full amount, you need 40 years of Canadian residency. You need to have at least 10 to qualify, but 40 to to get the, the regular payment that most people would get. That amount currently is $685.50 as of this quarter. And and the payment is adjusted on a quarterly basis uh, along with CPI. So, so it's inflation adjusted. Very important um, this year. Which, yeah, very important this year. And, and I was curious heading into the, the interview today. So the most recent adjustment was, I believe, 2.8% for, for one quarter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so which used to be the entire year. Exactly. Oh, well. Back in the day. So two things I want to hit upon there. First off, I want to make sure everybody realizes this. This is a residency qualification. You are not paying into this like you are with Canada Pension Plan. This is often this misnomer I see when people talk about it in various political spheres. It is paid for through general government revenues. Not uh, There's no slush fund. There's no credit uh, sitting there that you contributed to. It's just you lived in this country. It doesn't matter if you worked or not, but you're basically entitled to the benefit as long as you have 10 years. So what happens if you don't have the full maximum of 40 years. How is the benefit calculated? Yeah. So you basically, every year after your 18th birthday, you earn one 40th, so to speak. So if you had less than 40 years, say you had 30, you'd get 30 over 40, three quarters of that regular payment. If it was 35 years of residency you had after 18, you'd get 35 40ths of that payment. So it's, it's just kind of a, a simple mathematical equation. So it's actually one of the major pillars of what I think it was the UN identified as is, is what constitutes a secure retirement income system is a guaranteed minimum uh, income, which effectively is, uh, is in this case, um, is in this case all the, all the security because again you don't have to work you can be disabled you're still going to qualify for it as long as you live here so okay so that's the basics of it it's in a, it's it's indexed it's a set amount and it increases every quarter uh you qualify for it as early as 60 you sorry 65. Uh, 65 you qualify for it as early as 65 but let's talk about a couple of other unique things about this what happens if i get to 65 and i don't want to take it right then how long can i defer this yeah so you can defer it as long as you want basically every month between age 65 and 70 
you get an extra 0.6 of a percent by choosing to to postpone your starting point. So if if you start at age 66 instead of 65, you get an extra 7.2%, just 12 months times 0.6. That math continues to be true up until age 70. So at age 70, you would be getting up to 36% higher amount than if you had decided to start at the kind of the normal age, 65. And then if you postpone beyond 70, I think that the circumstances around wanting or that making sense are very limited. We'll get into that, I think, in a bit. But mm-hmm. you no longer accrue a, you know, higher pension amounts after age 70. Okay. So bottom line is I'm paid to wait until 70. And we'll get into the when you would want to do that in a moment, but I'm not paid to wait beyond that. Fair enough. Yeah. So let's uh, let's also talk about, we're going to talk about two different things. We're going to talk about both ends of the spectrum first. What happens when you are a low income earner and what happens when you're a high income earner when it comes to all these securities? So we'll start on the low end of the spectrum. If let's say I have, uh, you know, if someone's a, someone qualifies for all the security, but it's not the full amount, or maybe it is the full amount, but has no other sources of income is very low income. What else do they qualify for as part of this program? So if they're very low income, you would likely have, or potentially, depending on how low we're talking about, because the thresholds are low, low, low. I I say like 22, 23,000 ish. I'm not an expert on GIS, but the guaranteed income supplement is really what we're talking about here. Now that's clawed back starting at very low thresholds and and you do lose it when you're kind of around the, in in the 20th, 20,000 thresholds. And that's even quite complicated because it depends on whether both spouses are receiving OAS, the clawback thresholds on GIS change if, if only one of you is over 65 and receiving OAS or not. So GIS is kind of that low income supplement to go along with old age security. Yeah. So guarantee, So bottom line is that there's a top up that gets you up to, up to a certain threshold at most if you qualify for the full threshold. And uh, let's go. Now, you touched upon an important term there, which is clawback. So let's go over this in layperson's terms. What is a clawback and how does it work? Yeah. So so essentially, once once your income, and, and it's important to say, note that this is referring to your net income. So after your tax deductions, reduce your total income down. Once your net income exceeds a certain threshold, they begin to take away your old age security benefit. So that threshold for the year 2022 has been set at $81,761. And the way that that works is for every dollar above that, that your net income exceeds, they'll take away 15 cents of your old age security. So that's technically called a recovery tax, but in day-to-day speak, people refer to it as a clawback. So if you are the, the typical person who started your old age security at age 65 for the year 2022, you would basically lose all of your OAS once you're up to about 136,000. So, and I say I say about because we honestly at this point in the year we don't know because of the quarterly adjustments, we don't yeah. know what, you know, Q4 is going to bring as far as uh an amount. So any mm-hmm. reference to a clawback like the top end right now, it's it's a bit of a educated guess until we know what the Q4 amount is. Yeah, I mean, so on the low end of GIS, we know the threshold, uh, and unfortunately the clawbacks there are pretty brutal. It's like 50 cents on a dollar. So basically for every dollar you're over the threshold, to take back 50 cents. Now, the one saving grace is you don't pay tax twice. You pay that recovery tax, but you don't pay tax on the the piece in the first place. So that's one thing. And that applies at the high end of the spectrum, uh, where, as you said, the threshold, once you cross that threshold, 15 cents on the dollar goes back to the government, but you're not paying the marginal tax rate on that income altogether. I personally cannot stand (laughs) clawbacks. They are massive distortions of the tax code because you know, when you think about it, and I'm sure you'll agree with me on this, at the end of the day, when somebody's receiving OLA security, technically they now have a second set of tax brackets, right? They have this, oh, yeah. this second threshold different than everybody else in the country on there. And these are only, you know, this this clawback system is not unique. It is in a lot of things, everything down to the, you know, the Canada Child Benefit, OLA security. I think uh, someone gave me a list of, I think, 20 different benefits that are subject to clawback. Yeah. So when you think about how just weird and distorted the tax system can become, it's not one set of tax tables, it's multiple. And the same thing, if anyone listening in the U.S., the same thing exists uh, in the U.S. with the concept called uh, phase-outs, right? So they call them phase-outs. We call them clawbacks. It's the same thing. It's you go beyond a certain threshold, we start taking back something that we say you really, weren't really entitled to in the first place. And uh, it's a tax. Let's just call it a tax. <laughs> yeah. Effective rates. More important than marginal rates. What's your effective rate of tax? 
Yeah. And that's the thing a lot of people miss is that they will be like, you know, you can look up a tax table and say, oh, OK, that's where my next dollar of income is. But if you're subject to a clawback at that level, your effective rate is potentially higher than that, which is just never something anyone likes. It's uh, it's gonna basically yeah. going to be annoying to them. So now I said to you before we started recording. There is a, I would say, almost a disproportional amount of time relative to the amount of dollars that can be saved spent on pl- um, on planning around old age security clawback. It is something that tends to grind people. They really don't like the idea of it. So a lot of diversionary tactics, hopefully legally, are done. What are some of the ways that a family or an individual, a couple or an individual, can minimize their exposure to old age security clawback? So you could make RRSP contributions. So that's a simple one. Um, if you're uh, receiving OAS, so I guess this is this is only for a few years, probably 65 to 71. So if you make an RSP contribution, you get a tax deduction. That's going to lower your net income, potentially lower your exposure to clawback. You could just be strategic in drawdown schedules. So if, if you are taking money out of your RSP or your RIF, just be mindful of how much you take out. Some people People will skew their investment portfolio design, you know, to be less yield focused or income focused, more more growth focused. Just and this is in non registered accounts because that's the only one that really matters here. Yeah, so, so any more for stocks that pay capital gains versus the bonds. And actually, yeah. you bring up an interesting point here because I you, you you jump in on this online too. The people who are what we refer to as affectionately as dividend junkies who love Canadian dividends because of the special tax treatment. Talk yeah. to me about how they impact. Only security different than other forms of income. Yeah, so so a dollar of interest is taxed as a dollar on your tax return. If you receive a dollar of Canadian eligible, so most well all public companies that you're investing in are going to pay eligible dividends. And um, for a dollar of dividend that you receive on your tax return, it's grossed up at thirty eight percent. So you actually have to include a dollar thirty eight. So you can see how that over time adds up quite quickly, actually, and your income is actually higher than you might expect. It's going to be for tax purposes. So because of the way that the the clawback is calculated based off your net income, you just got to be mindful of that. And for people who have their own corporations, um, if especially for small businesses who don't have revenue over five hundred k. They're going to be paying dividends to themselves as a non-eligible dividend. So the the gross up there isn't quite as quite as painful from a OAS clawback perspective. Still lower personal tax overall, but the, on that side you got a fifteen percent gross up. So a dollar coming out of your personal corp as a dividend is going to be one fifteen on your tax returns. So you just have to be mindful of that. So, I mean, it's interesting because the um, like I said, a lot of people like to turn to quote unquote income generating sources in retirement. Dividends being chiefly one of them uh, again, and I've you know I've said it on this podcast before. Other ones that the uh, the tax efficiency of dividends is actually a myth. All that's happening is that you are paying less tax because the corporation paid part of the bill, but the next but the total dollars paid in taxes are identical. So yes. it is what it is. It's integration. It's integration, right? So anyone wants to go back and listen to that. Now, some people will say, well, why do I care what the corporation pays? I only care what I pay. Well, the corporation could pay you more if they weren't paying personal uh, corporate, um, corporate tax. So it's it's a moot point. Uh, the But the bigger point being that, unfortunately, because of the way this integration works uh, and the way all the security is, uh, is, is basically calculated off of gross income, which includes the gross up on dividends, as you said, 38% on Canadian dividends. So did a quick calculation there. For every dollar, for every dollar of Canadian dividends you're receiving, there's an additional five cents of all security going back on in addition to the normal taxes you're paying. So that deal is not as good as you think it is. And frankly, this is where potentially, I'm not a big fan of asset location. Uh, we talked about the strategy before in the show where you try to put certain yielding assets in different places. Uh, I think this is one that doesn't really work that well because you need to know what the growth rate is going to be in each of these different locations. But the reality is, is that in this case, that extra tax bit does really favor trying to minimize that in a non-registered account once you're over 60 and you're on that threshold. Mm-hmm. Now, for most people, though, this is like for most couples, though, this is not a, pre- a, big, a big concern, is it, right? Like, where's the clawback no. threshold right now? It's eight, almost 82,000, 81,761 per person. I, yeah. I should have mentioned that before. That's per person. Yeah. So, I mean, given the fact that you can split pension income, uh, including CPP, and uh, any payments coming out of your RIFs, not your RSP, this is important to note, you can't split RSP withdrawals, you can split RIF withdrawals. Yep. All those, that's $162,000 worth of income in retirement that you would have to, you would have taxed before you ever had a, a dollar clawback go back. 
Yeah, it's a lot higher than I think a lot of people would recognize. Yeah, they still get bent out of shit. It's funny, the number of people I've seen come in with like at 50,000 of retirement income per spouse and they're like, you know, I'm going to keep all my old security. I'm like, you got so much room. It's fine. But people have been, for years, we, we keep on hearing this this point. So I want to turn now to some of the stuff you've written about in the past um, and some of the let's call them more creative options for deferring when you have a higher income, right? So I'm subject to clawback. Maybe I'm subject to the entirety of clawback. I mean, you know, I think we discussed this in the past before too, where if you're continuing to work when you're in, when you're over 65 and you would get your all your security clawback back, regardless, there's no point in taking it until age, until 70. And actually, before we get to those creative things, let's, let's talk about why would you defer? And I just hit on one of them. You're still working, you're earning good money. You're going to get a clawback back anyway. There's no point. Mm-hmm. What are the other reasons for deferring your all the security to 70 or beyond? If you just want to maximize your lifelong income uh, throughout retirement and, and, Say you live in a family where you think you have a reasonable chance of living a a nice old age, maybe both your parents lived into their 90s, um, then uh, there's just a mathematical benefit to the postponement and the higher OAS amount. So if you're living into your 80s, that's probably... say If you you think you're only going to live to 75, don't postpone this. Take it at 65 when it's on offer. If you think you're going to live to 90, you're probably wise to postpone it to 70 just because the math of how much is going to get put in your pocket. This is very similar to the planning conversations around Canada Pension Plan that get a lot of uh, expo- uh, media exposure. The only difference here is that your benefit for waiting is not as high as with CPP. So a CPP, you get 42% extra if you wait to age 70. Here you only get 36 but conversation is kind of the same. So really just putting more money in your pocket. If you think that you are going to be running out of money, if, if you're nervous about not having enough investments, postponing to 70 and maybe taking some RSP money between 65 and 70 to bridge you and guaranteed a, a lifelong higher inflation adjusted, which this year, that's very important, as we can see, pension into your old age, um, it can add up. Absolutely. So one thing I want to stop here, though, quickly on is life expectancy, and this comes up quite often. It's let's unless you're you've got a lot of health issues prior to making the decision, it's kind of hard to make that call. We Absolutely, don't know. exactly. We don't know, right? So that that favors being cautious, in my opinion, and by that I mean potentially favors deferral unless you know there's a medical issue. Because frankly, the value of a guaranteed inflation adjusted pension, which is what this says for life from a backed by a government, is enormous. Like everything going on right now, frankly, if you're if you remember if you have CPP and older security at the fullest deferred extent, you're you know what you're feeling pain like everybody else is, but at least least you know that your your primary sources of income or two of your primary sources of income, they're immune to this to some degree. So it's huge. And I will also always say that, look, life expectancy is a misunderstood concept. Life expectancy is roughly the average someone your age is going to live to be. Great. Well, the thing is, is that that's an average. 50% of people live beyond that. So don't just say, and limited people say, well, why would I say for that? Life expectancy is 84. And it's just like, yeah. So are you wanna, you're you telling me you want to bet you die exactly on that day versus one of the 50% of people who die after that day? And it's mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, that's what it means. And in addition to that, it's like the mechanical rabbit at a dog track. You never really catch it until, well, until the end, really. And for every year that you live, your life expectancy actually increases because you're part of the survivor pool. You're not part of that 50% that died before that period. So when people are, this is just a way to tell people that, hey, when you're thinking about life expectancy, you have to err on the side of caution. And you have to understand that it's not a terminal date. It's a average. Yep. And, and so I wrote an article a few years back, and I think the title was OAS deferral, the grim possibilities and how to manage them, something like that. Anyways, the idea was even if you're starting out on the track to defer to 70 and between oh. 65 and 70, something medically comes up that is going to shorten your life expectancy, you're going to want to pivot and then apply and probably even reply, apply with a retroactive application to kind of as much as you can get back to that earlier starting application date. So how, how far back can we go on a retroactive application? You can go one year. Okay, so 12 months so back. If you wait so. till 68, you can only basically affect an age 67 start date. Mm-hmm. You can't go back to 65 and get, you know, three, four years worth of payments. Absolutely. And what, what that it, one lump sum. No, that is, and that is valuable. Now that has actually, others have tax implications we'll talk about shortly. But one of the key points to consider here, the one thing that does complicate this beyond CPP is that there is no survivorship benefit, right? So right. I pass away, my wife does not get any of my old age security going forward. So that's an important thing to remember there. Okay. So let's talk about uh, planning for some of the more unique planning opportunities you've uncovered, especially when it comes 
comes to deferring past 71. So talk to me about some of your better or favorite quote unquote tricks in this in this case. Sure. So first of all, the, I think there's just let me just talk about the mechanics of how, how, how to set this up a little bit. So when you do a application for OAS and you're older than 65, there is this retroactive. So when you're making your application, you choose when you would like to start it if it was earlier than the current date and you can go back to one year. So let's just say you do that. They're going to actually pay you a lump sum for that one year. And the important thing to note here is that it's taxed in the year that you actually receive that lump sum. So they're not going to request that you go back and adjust your prior year tax return because you're reaching back into that prior year. No, the the whole amount of the lump sum plus the ongoing monthly payments that you begin to receive after that, it's taxed in the year you actually get the money. So if, say, you apply in November, December, December, just given processing time, you're not going to receive that lump sum for the prior year until the following calendar year. And you're going to get the whole next year's monthly payments. So you'll effectively get two years of payments in one. And so this is a really, and, and then you're taxed in that following year. So this is a, a interesting planning point for someone who maybe is retiring in one year still has high salary um, in the current year that maybe would put them into clawback. But because they're retiring, uh, even if they wanted to start their OAS, they might want to wait, apply later with a retroactive to push that first year of OAS income into the next tax year when when they're fully retired. So that that's one just kind of, or I think a, a lot of people would potentially find use in that, yeah. um, shifting that first year around. Yeah, I mean, and that doesn't have to, like you said earlier, it doesn't have to wait until, um, you know, age 70 specific no. or 71, right? If you're retiring at 68, then, you know, the 69th year, you're going to have zero income. So that's, that's a wonderful way of kind of uh, fixing that. So, I mean, and that's not, you know, like I said, it's not a huge sum, but frankly, you know, we're, we're talking over $7,000 here. That is, that is now, if you, let's say, assume you were top bracket at, at you know, over 50%, most provinces versus mm-hmm. getting down to somewhere closer to 30, that's a couple thousand worth of savings there. Yep, definitely. And then you get into more niche scenarios. So let's say, someone's retirement income, put them at 150,000. They've just got corporate money. They're, they're winding down or they've got just large, very large amounts in RIF accounts or you name it for whatever reason, they've, they're just got lots and lots of income. And let's say on average, it's 150,000. So that basically claws back all of your OAS, even if you've deferred and you're starting until age 70. So what you could do, and this is this is really just designed to try and capture at least something out of the program. So you could wait until say you're 71. Now you've basically forgone your OAS all the way through 70. Now you're going to apply retroactively. Your one year reach back is going to be at the age 70, which is going to get you about currently 11,200 or so. Mm-hmm. But if you time it, you get two of those because you get the, the regular monthly ongoing amounts as well. Mm-hmm. So now you're up to over $22,000 total OAS received in that one year. And now your clawback ceiling, which I refer to a, as a super ceiling in this one year, is up to about 230, 231,000. So if for that retiree who has 150,000 of regular retirement income, they're going to have $80,000 of room there still in that year. So it's just it's just a way for someone to put kind of it's a one-time opportunity almost, put some money in their pocket out of this program. And if they didn't do the retroactive application and you know waiting to age 70, they're likely to not ever have been able to receive anything from it. And let's just be clear here. This is the ceiling, right? So this is the uppermost, like this is a point at which point it stops, oh, that stops, right? And, and the yeah. reason that is because it's a percentage, it's 15 cents on a dollar, but if you have more dollars, then it pushes the ceiling higher, right? That's right. Now, that doesn't change the floor. No. So they're still subject to it. And again, you know, simple example, someone's making $100,000. They were already subject to some clawback and left mm-hmm. with X amount of dollars. But now the increase of the, oh, the increase in OAS that they're receiving from this extra one-year bump up is not going to bump them up. It's, it's money that would otherwise never been able to keep. It would have been gone altogether. Yep. Yep. It's a, it's a great little one-off strategy. You also have a one-off strategy around how to structure your estate in some yep. cases. Care to speak about that? Yeah. So th- this one's even, even more niche. Um, so this is for someone who let's just, man, let's say, uh, what was my, what was my ceiling? I, I mentioned there for the, 
for the H seventy one strategy, it was like two hundred and two hundred and something. Two hundred thirty thousand was the the new ceiling for that person. So let's say someone had two hundred fifty thousand dollars of regular income each year. That strategy that I just walked through would not even give them anything because their income is so excessively high. So the only real way that someone in that situation would ever be able to get anything would be to never apply during their life. And then their executor or their you know personal representative, whoever's looking after managing their estate, applies on behalf of the deceased individual, has that same one year reach back ability, gets one year of OAS income, which is again, about $11,000 if you're beyond 70. But because it's received after death, there'd be the option to put that income onto what's called a rights or things return, which essentially is income that's due to you on death, but received after death. And because... Most of the other assets that they have would have been allocated onto the final tax return. Usually there's very, very limited sources of income that can be put on a rights or things. So you would very likely keep that full amount or, you know, it would be taxed on the rights or things filing, but at least not subject to, to clawback. So that one is really out there, but it, it it's an option. Still be um, on every estate planning checklist as far as I'm concerned. You know, if you're, if yeah. you're an executor, that little box should be there because, and I've seen this before, people are earning so much money. It's like, I'm not going to apply. I'm not going to get it. Great. Or, or this is a more practical approach would be if, if you're one of those people who was just simply had it in their financial plan that they were going to wait until 70 and they, they mm-hmm. got in a car accident between 65 and 70, but they hadn't yet applied yet. So this, this is where I actually picked up on a lot of this stuff because that happened to one of my clients who was mm-hmm. postponing and um, passed away. I had to figure out, is there anything we can do to help the widow in this situation, get some extra money in her pocket? And then I did the research on it, figured out that the executor could apply one year after. And, you know, that's kind of where a lot of these concepts started was just oh, out of that case, very of real life, unfortunate situation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, there is that risk always that you're deferring and you'll never benefit. But I mean, that strategy absolutely reduces the overall, if it goes sideways, it reduces it from, a you know, the benefit times five years to the benefit times four years. So again, it's, it, it is niche in that you're, if you're not super high income, then basically it's the five-year period that, that applies. If you are super high income, then it's the, you know, one, when, whenever you die at some point, any, anywhere in that, in that, in that entire length that where it doesn't matter. So overall and, and it's, I, I kicked this around with an estate lawyer as well. And um, her advice was rather than actually putting that as a paragraph within the will about, you know, a post-mortem application for OAS, you know, she, her suggestion was take it out of the will, put it on a personal memorandum or, you know, a letter of wishes, something like that, um, just to provide a bit of guidance for the executor. Because this is something that would, I, I probably 99 sure people scratch their heads at it, quite was, honestly. Yeah, it would fall through the cracks for sure. Yeah, it's funny because unlike Canada Pension Plan, which has a death benefit uh, that you receive at time of payment, old age security does not. But in, in effect, if we can, you know, if you're deferring and you can do this one year, if you're not receiving it already, you can do this one year for those people. It's a it's a death benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Any other weird um, tricks or quirks? Not really a, a trick or anything like that, but just we we haven't commented on it yet, so we probably should. Um, just recently, the amount for those who are age 75 or over got enhanced. Oh, yes. Then. Yep. So I think the first payments were in July, although don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it was July. Well, they're up now. No, October for the October ones are up for sure. And that's 754 versus 685. Of course, note this is 2022. We're saying this, so it's going to change. But yes, Mm -hmm. that's right. The Trudeau government did increase the amount payable to 75 people, 75 and older by, was that roughly $80 roughly per month? What can I say? Old people vote. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but I so think that, that was the, the, the first meaningful change to OAS payment amounts in a very, very long time. Yeah. And there is some basis for it in that uh, the need for, for care will proportionally increase over time. 75 is kind of a I would say is a reasonable time to assume that that sort of thing is going to start potentially. So mm-hmm. I, I do see the basis for it altogether, even though I joke about the politics of it. And those extra 10% amounts, they also are impacted by the deferral. So they're not excluded from that deferral opportunity. They're included within the calculations. Yeah. So even the super ceiling increases it after 75. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Super square. Excellent. So, uh, so yeah, that's one. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about age 71 to max out the super ceiling. I mean, technically now it'd be age 76. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause then you qualify for one year in arrears of 75. So therefore you get a bigger one. I mean, it's 80, (laughs) it's it's about a thousand dollars difference. Not bad. (laughs) 
yeah, I mean, you gotta, you gotta get through that, get through those years to make, make that count. But, yes. Yeah. And then, yeah. And, well, and then die. So <laughs> that's yeah. the best deal. Again, unfortunately too many things in planning revolve around what happens when you die. Anyway. So Aaron, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, this is a, like I said, kind of the overlooked step child, like a step sibling of, of Canada pension plan. Everybody thinks this is a lot simpler and easier to understand, but you know, I think you've done a good job of explaining. There are some nuances to planning around this. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on again, Jason. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And where can people find you? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty prevalent there. My profile is up to date. So that or email aaron.hector at cwbwealth.com. Thank you so much. That was today's episode of Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, unlike other issues such as Canada Pension Plan, uh, only security affects all of us the same way, not really business owners, except for maybe the dividend issue. So uh, as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals, business owners, and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca. You can even ask Surrey, Alexa, or Google Home to subscribe for you.